Someone once said, a friend is someone who knows all about you and still loves you. I've never heard anything more accurate in describing my friendship with Elsie. I know everything there is to know about her, her hopes, her dreams, her deepest fears, and I love more than life itself. We've been friends for as long as I can remember. Inseparable from wound to tomb, I always joke. I'm not that far off. I still remember the first time we met. We were both at the park next to Prince Pond, enjoying one of the last warm days of the year before the weather turned cold and oppressive. Her short, curly brown hair bounced wildly as she ran around in circles, just enjoying being out in the world. Finally, she waddled over to the pond, where I'd been quietly observing from. I've always been a shy person, much to my chagrin. When her vibrant green eyes first met mine, there was a strange feeling. I felt as though we were meant to meet, and the spark of recognition in her eyes made me believe she felt the same way. Though we were both young, I knew right then that we'd be friends forever. Then, without warning, she burst out laughing and clapped her hands, causing me to do the same. She has the most infectious laugh, making it impossible not to join in. As years passed, we lived through every experience together. I was the first to know about everything within her world. I was always an open ear whenever she needed to talk about her mean teachers, the boys she thought were cute, her heartbreak over relationships past, and what she wanted to do when she grew up. This fluctuated wildly from astronaut to homeless bum, depending on her mood. We saw each other every day, and the older we got, the more inseparable we became. Entire nights would waste away as we talked about everything and anything that was on her mind. Well, she talked, I mostly just listened with rapt attention. She was my world. Then, the day came when a letter arrived in a big manila envelope. We'd both been applying at colleges, praying we'd get into the same one. The letter was from her number one choice, the school she'd been dreaming of going to since she got into high school. I could practically slice the tension in the room with a knife. On her bed lay either a key to a bright future, or a crushing disappointment that would haunt her for the rest of her life. Finally, unable to restrain herself, she clasped at the envelope and tore it open with animalistic ferocity. Her eyes scanned over the page, and right as I'd started to lose hope, the moment I'd been waiting for finally happened. She smiled, smiled wide. Tears of joy started to flow freely down her cheeks and she started to vibrate in excitement. As if out of nowhere, we both screamed and started jumping up and down on her bed. We were both crying now, and I could barely see her through my tears, but I couldn't help it. I was so happy for her. I, being the nerdy bookworm of the pair, easily got into the school, though I didn't dare tell Elsie that. Before I knew it, summer break after senior year was already over and we were both standing in her driveway, ready to depart towards our destinies. I stopped for a moment to simply take her in. She'd grown to be a beautiful woman, more beautiful than I ever could hope to be. What had once been short, curly hair had turned into a flow of elegant brown curls that every girl was jealous of. The vibrant green eyes that captivated me all those years ago sparkled with determination as she stared into the trunk of the SUV, making sure she hadn't forgotten anything. She had a slender dancer's body from years of cheerleading and ballet that drove all the boys crazy. She was my idea of perfection, and I'd never let anyone hurt her. The drive to the school was long, but we filled the time by belting out nostalgic 90s classics at the tops of our lungs the whole way there. I wasn't sure what this new chapter in our lives would bring, but I was excited nonetheless. Together, Elsie and I could do anything. After a bit of frustrated wandering, we finally found our dorm. We'd learned ahead of time that we'd be rooming with one other person, Katie Ferguson, another freshman. When Elsie opened the door, we were greeted by a pair of large, naked breasts. Elsie instinctively shut her eyes tight, and I quickly followed suit. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize you were changing. Elsie sputtered out nervously. The other girl laughed and said, I wasn't changing, just getting comfortable. Elsie Morris and I assume, I'm Katie. I slowly opened my eyes and saw Katie offering her hand to Elsie. I then quickly noticed that she was still topless, and didn't show any plans of changing that fact in the near future. My cheeks burned and it was apparent that Elsie shared my discomfort. Elsie took her hand, refusing to break eye contact in fear she wouldn't be able to take her eyes off of the pair of elephants in the room. After a tense handshake, Elsie finally spoke up. W would you mind maybe putting a shirt on? I could have dropped to my knees and praised Elsie as a goddess in that moment. Katie laughed heartily again. We all have the, don't we sweetie? She took an uncomfortable few moments to look Elsie over. Yes we do, indeed she added quietly. 
Rage bubbled inside me, but I forced myself to stay calm for Elsie's sake. On the outside, I was as cool as a cucumber. On the inside, I'd already killed Katie half a dozen times. Uh, yeah, it's just a little uncomfortable, is all. I could tell by her voice that Elsie was gaining her confidence back. She was always such a confident person, which was one of the qualities that I admired most about her. Katie coated her smile in faux sweetness and grabbed a practically microscopic piece of clothing that probably barely passed as a shirt and pulled it on. I could still see far more than I wanted to, but it was an astronomical improvement. Anything for you, Elsie dear, Katie cooed. Katie was an insufferable roommate. She had a constant stream of sexual partners practically marching in and out of our room like there was a quota she was trying to meet. Men, women, it didn't matter. Her sexual appetite was insatiable, and on the few nights that we actually got to sleep in our own room, she would persistently and openly flirt with Elsie. As with most other people in our past, she practically ignored me, but every once in a while, when Elsie's back was turned, I'd catch her staring at me and smiling deviously. It was unnerving to say the least. I couldn't tell if she wanted to mangle me or mount me, and both were equally repulsive. Then, one night, it hit a boiling point. It was the Friday that started our winter break. we just finished up our last finals that day and Elsie and I had planned on going to bed early so we could get an early start home to beat the traffic of college students flocking off campus for the holidays. Katie had been suspiciously quiet all night, and had even climbed into bed at 8 when Elsie and I did. I was about to fall asleep when I heard it. Elsie. Katie's voice was disturbingly sensual. Elsie, I can't sleep. I could hear the playful pout in her words. Elsie chuckled and said, Well, considering you're usually up until the crack of dawn and it's barely past eight, I'm not surprised. Why not go out and do something? I don't want to go out tonight. I want to stay in, she paused for a moment, before adding, With you, Elsie dear. That little term of endearment always infuriated me. The way she said it felt so wrong. Elsie didn't reply, presumably trying to fall asleep herself. Katie was persistent, though. Elsie, I'm cold. The poutine was back. In her meager defense, Katie's side of the room was unquestionably colder than ours. Some crap about the heat not ventilating properly or something made her side a good 10 degrees cooler, and that can make a big difference in the thralls of winter. Katie usually remedied this problem by having a warm body on top of her, humping her brains out, but she was going without a friction-based space heater tonight. Elsie, I can't sleep. It's too cold. Can I lay in your bed for a while? No. Just go to sleep, Elsie hissed, clearly frustrated with this disruption to her own sleep. I promise I'll go right to sleep. I just need to warm up. Elsie let out an exasperated sigh. I knew that sigh well, and knew she was about to relent. My mind screamed, no, hundreds of times as loud as it could, but I couldn't find my voice. Elsie couldn't do this, it was clearly a trap. She had to know that, right? Fine. Yay! Katie exclaimed, and wasted no time sliding into bed next to Elsie. I was mortified. Elsie was so much smarter than this, but Katie's relentless nagging had finally broken her down. Though I hoped and prayed that nothing would come of it, I knew, deep down, that this couldn't end well. The first sign of trouble came in the form of a frantic whisper. What are you doing? Katie kissed Elsie's neck and brought her mouth close to Elsie's ear, seductively purring, just go with it. You'll love it, I promise. To my horror, Elsie complied. Katie continued to kiss Elsie's neck, and when I heard Elsie take a sharp intake of breath, I knew exactly what was happening. I could see their obscene movement underneath the blanket that they shared. I couldn't help but feel as though I, myself, was being violated. As Elsie moaned with pleasure, I wanted to scream in agony. I felt guilt and shame overtake me and I desperately wished I could cry, but I was too numb to the world. After they'd finished, Katie gave Elsie one last kiss on the neck and whispered, told you you'd like it. She then rolled out of the bed, a smug smile on her face, and got dressed silently in her patented slutty clubber outfit. Without another word, she slipped out of the room, leaving Elsie snoring softly. My rage at that moment burned so hot that I couldn't help myself. I stormed after her. She defiled my best friend. This harlot had tricked Elsie into allowing her into her bed, preying on her kind, giving nature. Katie had deflowered the most precious thing I had in this world, and she would pay. When she stopped to chat up a group of frat guys that were clearly drunk, I snuck into the back seat of her Honda Civic. It felt like forever past, 
and I was wondering if she'd even make it as far as her car or if she'd just let the frat boys take turns using her like the cheap horse she was in call it a night. However, she finally sauntered over to her car, a piece of paper with a few numbers on it tucked in her palm. It was almost too easy to hide from her as she entered the car. She was so preoccupied entering the numbers into her phone I'm surprised she remembered to close her door. She started driving and I prayed that she was going where I thought she was going. There were a number of clubs in the area, but most of them were pretty lame, even by my standards. Two of them were straight out of the 60s and the third had a nautical theme, for some reason. Nothing gets young people hot and bothered quite like the screeching of seagulls. If I was correct, Katie would make the extra drive to the next town over, where there was a club that was insanely popular with the kids of our college. This, luckily, would provide a long stretch of road without any security cameras and with very little traffic. That's where I would strike. My plan was simple. I was going to jump out at her and scare her, then tell her to stay away from Elsie or else. In hindsight, this plan was pretty poorly thought out, but I was fueled by adrenaline and anger, so I wasn't exactly thinking rationally. Once we'd been out of town for a few minutes, I put my plan into action. As I started to jump out at her, the rage that I'd felt when she was touching Elsie resurfaced with added vigor. What the foo dash? Before she could finish her obscenity, my hands were around her throat. I squeezed as hard as I could. Her windpipe collapsed easily within my grip and the choking noise she made only made me squeeze tighter. The car swerved right and left as she took her hands completely off the wheel, trying to pry my fingers from her compressed neck. I wouldn't be stopped, though. Katie would die tonight. My heart was beating like a drum practically pounding out of my chest. In the moment I didn't even notice, but tears were streaming down my face the entire time, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs. In one moment I could hear her gasping for air that I was forcefully denying her, and the next moment, there was a deafening explosion of metal bending and breaking from impact. The crash forced me to let go of her throat. I'd expected airbags to go off in circumstances like this, but apparently Katie's piece of crap Civic didn't have any so there was nothing to cushion our bodies. I bounced hard off of the dashboard before falling back into my seat, a sea of pain washing over every inch of my body. I could feel the heat of the growing inferno on my legs. My head lulled lazily to the left and I looked at Katie. Her head was completely gone, and there was a circular hole in the windshield. The last thing I did before blacking out from the pain was chuckle softly to myself. I groggily opened my eyes as a blaring alarm woke me from unconsciousness. An annoyed groan rumbled from somewhere in the room, a groan I'd recognize anywhere. I was back in our room, with Elsie. We both glanced over at Katie's bed, which was empty. Elsie shrugged, probably assuming she'd gotten drunk and hooked up with someone, or several someones, and was sleeping off her hangover. I thought back to her lifeless, headless corpse, and wondered if it had all been just a dream. None of the pain I'd felt the night prior was present. If it was a dream, it was one of the best I'd ever had. With little ceremony, we grabbed our pre-packed bags and threw them in her SUV. In a matter of minutes, we were on our way back home. There was no traffic whatsoever, and it wasn't even 10 o'clock when we arrived back at her house, making us both laugh at how unnecessarily early we'd woken up. She was always so pretty when she laughed. We spent every day of our break together, even Christmas. I felt like I was a part of her family, and I practically was. We'd been inseparable since the day we met like twin sisters who never fought. At one point, after Elsie had unwrapped a box of condoms, a joke gift from her older brother, and was laughing hysterically as her parents stood there, mortified, something hit me like a ton of bricks. I was in love with Elsie. I still am, and I think I always will be, but at that moment, it was as clear as day. I would take this secret to my grave, however. I was far too shy and anxious to ever let her know how I truly felt. Simply being her friend was more than enough for me. Things changed when we got back to school. It spread across campus pretty quickly that Katie died in an accident. She was one of the most popular girls at the small private college, more out of infamy than anything else. Though most of the details were suppressed, the tidbit about her decapitation was too grisly not to make it into the story. Elsie and I were questioned, though I could tell the detective wasn't paying any attention to me. Not that I minded, I was petrified during the whole ordeal. They seemed pretty content with the theory that she was alone and had purposely crashed into a large redwood on the side of the road. She died on impact. They were just following up with the people that knew her to see if she had any reason to end her life, as she'd never applied the brakes during the incident.
The news that this was being considered a suicide hit Elsie pretty hard, though I couldn't fathom why. I was under the impression that she hated Katie as much as I did, but Elsie was different after Katie's death. The fierce determination that had pushed her to achieve anything she set her mind to diminish to nothing. She stopped going to class, she started partying and drinking excessively, and she stopped eating. I wanted desperately to break her out of this funk, out of this depression, but I didn't know what to say. My best friend in the whole world, the woman I loved, was falling apart in front of me, and there was nothing I could do about it. It was at the last party she'd ever attend that she met Jake. The second I saw Jake, I knew he was trouble. He was the textbook definition of a smooth talker, and I could tell that he was used to always getting what he wanted. On top of that, he was undeniably handsome. All of this, paired with the fact that Elsie had been binge drinking for a week straight, led to a disastrous situation. Before I knew what had happened, the three of us were back in Elsie's and my room. I was sitting quietly in the corner as Elsie and Jake attempted to suck each other's tongues out through their mouths. I desperately wanted to object, but I was too afraid of being scolded by Elsie to say anything. That didn't stop me from fervently praying and hoping that she'd put an end to this insanity, of course. Jake's hand wormed its way underneath her shirt and onto one of her breasts. She pulled back, giggled a bit, and slurred, Hey, hands off mister. He obviously didn't think she was being serious, and started groping her some more. With a mighty shove, she yelled, Get off of me, creep. His ass hit the floor, but, in the blink of an eye, he was back on his feet. What the EFF did you just call me you little tramp? Elsie's anger boiled over and I saw that fire and determination in her eyes again for the first time in months. Before she could harness it, however, Jake was on top of her. He had both of her arms pinned to the bed, but that was unnecessary. Though I couldn't see what happened, I heard a loud bang. A pool of red started leaking from the back of Elsie's head. Her eyes were closed, and her body was limp. My vision went red. There aren't words for how hot and intense the rage and hatred burned inside of me. My teeth were clenched so tightly I thought I'd cracked them. A small trickle of blood started to drip from my palms as my fingernails dug in. This piece of absolute human garbage hurt Elsie. He made her bleed. He was going to rape her. Now, he was going to die. He staggered a few steps back from the bed, mumbling under his breath. I didn't care what he had to say. Before he could react, I tackled him to the ground. He was solidly built, so I had some trouble keeping him down, but a quick elbow to the back of the head worked well enough. A groan escaped his lips, and I flipped him over so that I could see into this monster's eyes. They went wide with terror. How the hell? I wanted to cry, to scream until my throat bled, but in this crazed state, all I could do was attack. The terror in his eyes changed to surprise and panic as my teeth sunk into his neck. It was more difficult than I would have ever imagined to rip someone's throat out but not impossible. The warm, coppery taste of blood poured over my teeth and down my throat, almost forcing me to vomit, but I choked it back as I spit his useless flesh to the floor. His life was already fading, but I was far from done. As he clasped hopelessly at his throat, feebly trying to stop the bleeding, I plunged my thumbs into his eyes and hooked. He tried to scream, but his larynx was lying on the floor along with the rest of his throat. I withdrew my thumbs and started pounding on his chest as hard as I could. I knew he was dead long before I stopped. Tears had started to fall down my cheeks in a torrent and I was sobbing loudly. Finally, I stood up on shaky legs and walked away from him. In only a few steps, I was standing next to Elsie, still unconscious on the bed. My hand found its way to her luxurious curls and I stroked her hair lovingly. I backed away immediately upon hearing her groan and start to stir. I didn't want the first thing she saw when she awoke to be me in this state. She rose slowly from the bed her hand drifting foggily towards the wound on the back of her head. Another groan. This groan was cut short as she noticed Jake on the floor. What the? She whispered. Her eyes went wide and darted around the room, searching for the source of this mutilation. Finally, they landed on me. My stomach churned so intensely that I thought I'd vomit again, but I needed to be strong for her. Our eyes stayed locked on each other. I could feel myself start to shake violently, and I could see her doing the same. In a flurry of movement, she was right in front of me. Her eyes drifted up and down my body, making me feel, of all things, self-conscious in that moment. She looked at my bloodied face while touching her own, as if she was searching for something that wasn't there. Her gaze landed on my mangled shirt, then she looked at her own pristine, white one. She repeated this so many times that it was almost dizzying. When her eyes finally met mine again, 
I smiled slightly and pressed my finger to my lips, as if we were little girls again and we had a secret to keep. She screamed. The shriek was so loud and sudden that it made me jump, which only made her scream more. Before I could say a word, she darted out of the room. I chased after her the best I could, only catching occasional glimpses of her through windows and the like. The chase didn't last very long, and I saw her run into the police department. I knew I couldn't follow her there. They'd be coming after me and, if I was in prison, I'd never get to see Elsie again. That couldn't happen. I'd wait for my chance to talk to her alone and explain myself. She would understand. I loved her, after all. The next few months went by in a blur. Elsie was admitted to a psychiatric hospital, presumably due to the trauma of seeing Jake's dead body. If you ever read this, Elsie, I'm so sorry for that. I never wanted you to see that, I swear. I visit her every day. I saw her a few times, but whenever she noticed me, she bowled in the other direction screaming. I don't understand what's going on. We're best friends. Can't she see I did what I did for her? Can't she see that she's my entire world? I spend all of my time at the hospital, but I haven't seen her in weeks. I miss her so much that I'd give my life for just one more chance to see her smiling face. I wish this had turned out differently. I wish she could see that I did all of those horrible things out of love. I wish she never ended up in a horrible place like this. But, more than anything else, I wish she'd let them put up a mirror in her room.